Welcome. I'm Sally Trainer. Today's lesson is small format landscape. We're going to be working wet and wet, and the triad will be cobalt blue, Windsor yellow, and permanent rose, plus French ultramarine where we want to get dark darks. Uh, the purpose of today's lesson is not just to use this triad, but to learn how to control the amount of water and pigment in your brush and how to blot, and how to work with wetness in the paper, and how to re-wet the paper when it gets too dry. So let's paint. Um, the palette in this is permanent rose, cobalt blue, and um, I used Windsor yellow. Hansa yellow light or Hansa yellow um, are, are quite appropriate here. You could also use Aurelin, which is a slightly cool yellow. Um, all yellows are just a little bit opaque. Uh, if you use them on top of things, they, they will hide things. Um, but in this case, it doesn't matter because we're working wet and we're gonna be working, um, we're gonna be working with a sponge. We're gonna be working with um, something I showed you in the first iteration of this, which is, um, and I'll show you this in a minute in more detail, but uh, this is a piece of terry cloth. It is, um, wet, or I should say just damp, but um, I'm going to use it underneath my um, wet and wet paper. I, I don't have to re-wet. I can do things for a long time without uh, intruding with more water, and that's important. It's important, again, with this exercise to control the amount of water you're using um, and how many times you dip your brush into uh, your water bucket and never ever rinse your water bucket or your brush in your water bucket. You always want to keep accumulating paint. The only time you rinse is when you switch to yellow. So this is a, a full triad painting. Uh, the problem with this triad is that the um, we can't get very dark with it. None of these have very high tinting um, uh, possibilities. And so I have added plus one to this, and that is French Ultramarine. French Ultramarine is um, a primary blue, and it is the same family, the same visual spectrum as cobalt blue. But what it has is a tinting uh, property that's far superior to cobalt blue. So anytime I want to go dark, dark, I can bring that uh, French ultramarine into the painting without disturbing the harmony that I've got with my triad. All right, so let's start. Um, I have a thirsty uh, sponge here because I don't want to saturate this piece of paper, but I do want it wet on both sides. Um, okay, so back to aerial perspective. Um, things that are in the farthest distance are low intensity, lower in value, that means less value, lighter, and less detailed because um, in reality, we might know what's in that background far away, but we can't see it. And if you put a lot of detail into the background, immediately it leaves the space in your painting and it becomes way too important and it destroys your aerial perspective, the illusion that you're creating for your viewer. Uh, Mid-distance, a little bit darker, a uh, little bit more intense, a little bit uh, more detailed, not a lot. And as you come forward, those conventions just keep adding intensity, value, and detail. So think about whatever your farthest far is as being almost absolutely absent any detail and very low in intensity and pretty light in value. So for this piece, um, well, always I start with my farthest far and in a landscape, it's the sky. And now I have a piece of damp paper. Um, I have my thirsty sponge hap, uh, handy in case I need it uh, because things do dry out. I have a lot of light coming down here and it is drying things rapidly. But I just want to make sure that I have no standing water on my piece of paper. And it's ready to go. 
it's a little bit limp, which means it's, you know, got good saturation. I have it on my damp piece of toweling, which I have really squeezed so it's just merely damp. The damp toweling will wick away any extra water instead of letting it go back and make uh, bad marks around the edge of my paper. The reason I didn't start out with uh, in my triad with the French ultramarine is that it makes really deep, dark, not attractive greens. And I didn't want that to happen here unless I was uh, going toward dark darks. So to make an attractive range of greens, I go in this case to uh, a primary yellow that doesn't have a lot of red in it. It's not a warm yellow, although yellow is a warm color. And it, couples nicely with cobalt blue and cobalt blue and any nice uh, primary yellow will give you a beautiful range of greens. So that's what we're doing. So let's just take a look at what's going on in my palette. I'm still being generous with water. I'm, I'm grabbing up a whole bunch of water and I'm re-wetting a puddle of green, but I'm gonna add to that right now. Let me tell you, I almost always forget what I'm doing and I go into my blue first and then I add my yellow. And when I go into my yellow, because I don't like to rinse my brush, I get a lot of blue in it. Into that nice big puddle, I'm adding those two colors for my first bit of green. And then up here, I've got a puddle of blue, and over here I have a bit of the red. Red does, um, does a lot of things pretty dramatically in this kind of setup, so be sparing with your red. Okay, so my farthest far is the sky, and I kind of like to kind of run my brush over things and let a little dry brush stuff happen. And then I like to come back in with stronger pigment into the wet areas that I've given so that I've got some nice variety going on in the sky. I'm not gonna put a mountain in here. So maybe I'll bring the sky down a little bit further. Got some interesting clouds going on. Let the watercolor work for you. I always think of watercolor as the lady, lazy man's medium because it will give you things you cannot paint deliberately. Uh, let's go ahead and add a little bit of green down toward the horizon. Not much value. Uh, we'll let it flow out into what's going on. And let's do the same thing with just a little bit of red. Again, not much value. And I'm doing that so that there's shared color everywhere. Any color that appears in one place is going to appear in another place. So I'm going to take my thirsty sponge and uh, when I do this, I'm not adding a puddle of water any place. I'm just adding dampness. So let's go ahead and do some pieces of terrain. And I'm starting with the green and I'll come back into this. Um, I then want to, uh, I'm gonna switch brushes, but you can rinse your brush. But the reason I'm switching is because I have a lot of brushes and I can do that. Yellow is one of those things that carries over distance. And so I feel free to put yellow back in there where it can be kind of illogical ordinarily. Uh, as we move forward, I've not rinsed the brush in which I have the green. I've just kept enriching my puddles. Okay, so I've kind of got the paper covered now. I want to start putting some detail. I can put deep detail in the middle distance, and one of the ways to do that with the most effective uh, reach is uh, by switching to a rigger. Riggers are long haired brushes. Uh, this one is a five. They hold a lot of pigment or water and because of the tip and the slenderness of the accumulation of hairs, you really can direct where things are going. So now let's go into what we've got here and let's enrich this puddle and I just did it again, but went into the blue before the yellow. I want 
to have something darker happening here and I'm gonna add some red to it because I'm going into the middle distance and that means it's gonna be lower intensity. So let's just create uh, a horizon, literally. It's in the middle of the paper. Uh, at this point, always blot your brush before you go onto your paper because otherwise it will spread uncontrollably. And keep enriching your puddle. Now that's a mixture of all three, which is kind of interesting. Heavy on the red. Let's start giving ourselves some things popping up above the horizon. I'm not brushing this on so much as dropping it on. I'm letting it flow out of my brush. And as we go along, you'll see as the paint gets thicker and the brush has less water in it, these strokes will give you interesting things happening. Kind of like uh, having a tree stick up there. And because um, I've got both wet and dry areas in the sky, uh, some of them will become fuzzy and spread out into that available water because the new pigment will always take advantage of available wetness to spread. It's not wet, I'll get a hard edge. So you have to be wary of that. And sometimes you wanna take advantage of it and sometimes you don't. So let's get some variety in the background. Uh, it's the middle distance, remember, so it's not terribly far away. And I'm still using that same combination of colors because I can. And it seems to me effective uh, to be where it is in space. And I'm not dipping back into the water yet because I'm not switching colors at all yet. Um, I will probably switch brushes in a little bit. And, okay, I am gonna switch because I'm gonna come to the next nearest part of this painting. And I'm letting, I'm letting the colors flow down into the wetness below them because I, I might make use of that. It might be the background to something that's in front of it, or it might just delineate um, a change in terrain. So let's go back to our green, but let's make it a little more saturated. What's happening here? I can paint right over all of this and I can increase saturation anytime I choose. Sometimes I'm gonna be painting behind things. In space, I'm maybe behind, maybe in front. Right now I'm in front of this row of light area back here with this line, but I'm behind this area. So remember, whatever comes closer to you at the bottom of the paper um, is in front. Every time I change my day at that my diagonal stroke, I move something in front of something else. I'm gonna switch brush again and go back to my cobalt. And I think I want maybe a little pond in here. Now, some places that's gonna turn green because it's mixing with available yellow. And sometimes it's just gonna stay blue. Okay, now I've just suggested that there, there might be some water going on here. So let's just concentrate now on doing um, thicker and thicker paint that's gonna give me better detail. Let's go back. To me, it makes sense rather than to keep rinsing a brush and introducing water to switch brushes and make sure that each of those brushes is going back into the puddle that I've identified for it, the color. So let me go back to this and I'll come back with this brush and to control that water and I can add detail. I can just make, make something stronger, but I can also take some of this hairy stuff that bled down and enhance it and turn this row of yellow into stuff. So now I have some bushes that are starting to happen. They're, they're pretty abstract. In front of my eyes, this close, they are very abstract. So you're still pretty wet, Sally? I am pretty wet still. Um, in the areas where I have added paint, uh, not the sky anymore, pretty much, but where I've added paint, I've got really quite a lot of water. And always test your brush to make sure what you've got in that brush. 
Um, be careful not to make things too regular. So you don't want a bunch of uh, polka dots or uh, too many repeated shapes. Now I'm coming with this green and I'm putting it into that area that has a lot of red in it, which changes it a lot. I'm barely touching the paper, but I'm changing the, the nuance to that area that was too red and too kind of maroony. Let's bring some of that over here and let it invade. Anything you put in that's wetter than what's there will push the stuff that's already there out of the way. And that's kind of a nice thing to know about because you can use it to make new shapes. Sally, could you say that again, please? Okay, anytime you introduce into a wet area, new wetness, if it's wetter than what's there, it's gonna move the pigment that's already there out of the way. Okay, I'm working with a brush that's mostly green right now and I'm gonna add more French ultramarine to it, which is gonna give me uh, darker dark than I would get by adding cobalt. Since I'm using separate brushes now, I don't have to go back into my bucket at all. I just keep adding pigment to make things stronger. Now I'm taking a clean brush and I don't like this very hard edge here. So I'm gonna, and I'm working on dry sky. That's why I'm getting that hard edge. I'm adding water up there so that I can get these indistinct shapes that just suggest uh, different kinds of, of uh, foliage that's happening in the background. I'm gonna come back into this up here, which is still pretty damp to change the color a little bit, make it a little greener. Again, I'm just barely touching the paper. I don't wanna move around what's there uh, in any way that isn't something natural because it's wet. Because it's wet, it's gonna move anyway. And I want the watercolor to do my job for me. Uh, it's getting pretty dry down here. So we're gonna to have to start working on that a little more. I'm still adding color um, now, because I've introduced a good bit of French ultramarine, I'm getting some nice granulation, which is adding to the illusion of, of um, foliage and leaves and, you know, that kind of separation without having to paint it. Uh, French ultramarine is one of those pigments. Uh, originally, and I don't know that it is completely anymore, it was made out of lapis lazuli. It's a gemstone. You can powder it but you cannot make it soluble. So it remains independent particles. And so it granulates out and it gives you a really wonderful grainy appearance to what's happening. I'm gonna dip up a little water, but not, not change the saturation in my brush because now I wanna give myself, uh, first of all, I wanna bring some of this color down because I like shared color throughout a painting. And I'm gonna give myself a little shoreline here just barely touching the paper again. And that shoreline is gonna show me where this row of foliage starts and where the water comes after it. And I'm gonna introduce just very scant bit of the red in here, just the plain red, and let it bleed into that foliage that's next to my little, my little area of water. And then, you know, usually I think ahead and I have three different brushes of three different colors. I didn't do that today. Um, I'm, making a, I'm making a little bit of a shoreline here and a little bit of a reflection. And now this is quite a bit drier. So again, my clean brush that has only water on it. I'm gonna lose that edge to make sure that it doesn't hard edge on me. And I'm gonna come in on the other side of that little shoreline and give myself some yellow as a reflection. And then I'm gonna come in with a little bit of red in here. Again, I'm, I'm just introducing some of this red uh, now into some of the wet areas so that I've got that shared color working throughout. This gives me kind of a built-in color harmony that I don't even have to think about. If I were actually looking at this scene, I probably wouldn't see all that red. But since I'm making up this scene, I can put it wherever I want. I am the boss of this painting. Sally, I have a question about the um, permanent rose in the background. Is, is that separating out from the mix you put down 
or does permanent rows just move faster? Uh, that's a good question. The reason that it's bigger than where I put it, um, it was still damp in the sky when I put it on and that was the last thing that I put. So it was the new puddle and it invaded as far as it was allowed okay. to go. So what we've got now is a, just a little scene that doesn't have much um, importance in any way, but I think it has some visual impact as a little tiny painting. I don't like what's happening here because it's too similar to what's over here. I know this sky is pretty dry. I'm gonna put more of this color up here and then I'm gonna come in with my clean water and I'm gonna lose that edge so it becomes part of a mass uh, that will oppose this mass over here. And now I'm gonna come in with, I'm just gonna to have to add some saturation to this puddle. I'm gonna to have to dip up a little water because my puddle has dried up. Grab a little yellow and a little red and a little blue to get back to these colors. And now this is, this is wet because I just put it there. And so I'm changing this mass to represent something quite different from what it was. And now it's different from this mass over here. So I have the time to do that because this has become dry. I can apply that new paint and then lose that edge uh, without disturbing the sky if I do it very gently. Mine, I like if I'm trying to just draw through my, you know, from my head, it doesn't look like anything. And I don't know if it would it help to pull up like pictures of landscapes or something to kind of have a notion of what we want to do. You know, that's a very good question. I uh, first of all, um, I've been doing landscapes for so long, um, just like Mike Killalay, um, that we have embedded in our consciousness all kinds of terrains and how they look as they go back in space. Um, I find, unless I'm working plein air, for instance, that I get trapped in a photograph and I start to be um, something uh, other than um, a painter and I start to be a coloring book person. Mm -hmm. and like that in my work at all. So I, um, I quite often will start with a reference, but I often do not go beyond just kind of basics of where things are in space, where there's a mountain, how important it is, where other things are happening throughout. So I think it's worthwhile when you are starting a project to have a reference, but I also don't want be a slave to it because you'll find that your work becomes more rigid. And Sally, I just was going to get a piece of toweling. How wet should we make them? Okay, um, I soak it and then I squeeze it as tightly as I can so it is merely damp. Um, okay. And by and large, um, I like to keep the toweling kind of neutral and yeah. without a pattern. So let me hold this up again. Um, I, I'm getting no bleed back place around this and it's largely because of the damp paper toweling. Um, I can still feel wetness on the back of this. I could keep working on this for probably another hour. Um, I don't want to, but it's, um, that's just a nice trick. And when I'm just working on my non-porous surface, I have to keep lifting my paper and wiping any standing water so it doesn't bleed back. Mm -hmm.